Blumenfeld, and I'm really happy to be here to represent Avenue to Wellness. We have another wonderful speaker in our series that's here tonight. And before I introduce her, I'd like to just remind everyone that our community program is also based on community uh, donations. So we really appreciate the donation in our donation box. And if you haven't heard about some of our programs, look on our website. It's called avenuestowellness.org. And you'll hear about the different uh, programs we have in the cafes in town, and also the ability to get a discount card so you can see health practitioners. Our service area runs from Redwood Valley up to Covalo, and we'll be adding new programs all the time. I'm really pleased tonight to invite our special guest. Uh, she took over the practice of our beloved Frank Grassi a couple of years ago, our best practice, and she has made a big impact in our community as far as doing wonderful work and also this volunteer work with the Humane Society, Inland Humane Society. So I'm really pleased uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Hanna and please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Doreen. So the first thing that I want to say, of course, is thank you for coming and supporting this program, which is great. Um, and that I'm going to try to you guys as much information as I can on this topic um, but I'm not trying to sell you services and there are three great practices here in town and every one of them can provide you with good dental care before during and after so I'm going to talk about the importance of dental care in dogs and cats um, people and horses also need good dental care but that's not my specialty so I'm just gonna focus on dogs and cats today as everybody I'm sure already knows dental health is important to overall health. Keeping your teeth and gums healthy can prolong life and longevity, health and well-being in general. And we'll talk about how some of the, some of the ways that dental disease can impact organ and system health and how we can prevent that. Some of the signs of dental disease in dogs and cats are, of course, starting with bad breath, simple, easy to identify for everyone, Teeth that are movable, colored, or um, are surrounded by tissue that is not healthy. Sometimes pain around the mouth. Sometimes dogs and cats will drool or have trouble getting food into their mouth or chewing it once it's in their mouth. Sometimes you will see bleeding from the mouth. And sometimes um, animals will become withdrawn and or inappetent. So weight loss will occur. I hope that there's nobody that's too squeamish because there are some pretty graphic photos here. Dental disease obviously is not always readily clear to people. It's my job as a veterinarian to look and identify problems and inform you and re make recommendations. A lot of people say, what about coyotes and wild dogs and wild cats and they don't get dental care and that's true. Um, they also live much, much shorter lives um, and in the wild they capture and kill their prey but their, their job is to protect themselves and stay alive. And so generally, animals will not show any sign of illness or weakness until they're, they're very, very ill or, or unable to go on. These are gradually developing conditions most of the time, so they're not things that happen overnight. And so things can become sort of, when things trend towards disease, um, it's not always readily obvious. It's not like a broken arm where you can say it was fine today and it wasn't fine to, uh, the next day. Um, a lot of owners will describe typical signs that they think of as aging or grumpiness that really represent underlying dental disease or gum disease that can be addressed and treated. And of course, after dentistry, owners often feel that their pet has made a huge uh, change in behavior. So think animals are more outgoing and involved and uh, animated. So again, it's my job to look. Um, it's not your job to know unless you know that there's a problem and present it. It's my job to look and, and see. And we look for anything that could be causing disease in the mouth, tumors, dental disease, ulcers, other kinds of lesions, foreign bodies. You wouldn't believe how many dogs come in with something stuck in their oropharynx or between their teeth and they just, they can't get it out. So it causes pain and distress. So anytime we see your pet, we will um, evaluate the oral cavity, look for any of these abnormalities, record them, and every year every, or every time we see your animal, we'll be comparing it to what we saw last time. 
So this is a perfect example. Looks like Leroy. <laughs> pretty, pretty close to, pretty close to perfect. And this is a healthy mouth. This is a young, healthy dog with no dental disease. And this is probably what most dogs' teeth look like at six to eight months of age. And then your labs and your shepherds and your large breed dogs are going to maintain that beautiful, healthy mouth for the rest of their lives. It's our smaller dogs or dogs that have fractures that are going to have other problems. I'm going to go through some things and we'll talk about periodontal disease mostly, but we look for any abnormality. So when you're looking under the gum line or looking under the lip, we're looking for things like extra teeth. And these are just, this is a pretty young, healthy dog that just has some retained baby teeth. And those baby teeth normally fall out when the adult teeth move in. And if this were presented to me, we would recommend extracting those extra teeth because they will cause problems down the line. I'll show you that. Everybody has baby teeth. We all lose our baby teeth when we're in our middle school grades. And puppies and kittens lose their teeth between three and a half and about six months of age. And they're replaced with adult teeth. We'll show you some, some good pictures of that. So does anybody know? How, how many teeth dogs have, or normal dogs have? Does anybody have a normal dog? <laughs> that, that's the more to the point, okay. So um, dogs have 42 teeth, which seems like a lot of teeth. And so in a shepherd or a lab, that seems reasonable, but in a chihuahua or a Maltese, they have exactly the same number of teeth that they're just smashed into a tiny little head. And that's part of the reason that they develop dental disease so early in their lives. Cats, this is not a perfect cat mouth, but um, <laughs> cats have slightly fewer teeth, but not much. They have, um, well, 16 fewer teeth and 26 baby teeth and 30 adult teeth, which is also quite a lot of teeth. Very common to find baby teeth that are retained in the adult dog. And usually those are things that we see when we're doing their first you know, exam or right before they go to get spayed or neutered. And so we'll go ahead and just take those out at the time of the spay and neuter because it's simple and easy and it will prevent problems down the line. Um, most of the time in your large breed dogs, um, those, those uh, primary teeth will just be pushed out by the entrance and eruption of the secondary teeth. In little guys like Maltese and Chihuahuas and Yorkies, those guys, for whatever reason, there's just so much crowding that the um, primary tooth doesn't get pushed out and it gets stuck. So here's an example of a canine tooth that's retained. So that adult, that secondary canine tooth has come all the way in and it didn't push that primary tooth out of the way. So it's still there, it's stuck there. If you wiggle it, it'll either break off and the root will be stuck up underneath the gum line. So we just extract that, very simple. So here's an example of what happens if we don't remove that deciduous canine tooth. Tartar will develop between those two teeth because they're not supposed to be so close together and they will create a periodontal disease in there. So some of the other things that we see when we're just looking just to make just a general health check and oral exam, we'll see fractured teeth. And this is a good example of something that's chronic and you might just bring your cat in or your dog in and I'll say, oh, hey, there's a fractured tooth. And normally because the gum line looks pretty healthy around it, it might not be something that we need to do anything with, except here you see that the root canal is open. The root canal is essentially a, a cavity and it's capped by the, the top of the enamel and dentin of your tooth. And when that's broken, bacteria can get in and it can become painful and infected, and that can cause a problem, including infection of the jaw bone itself. Here's another example, and this is probably by far and away the most common thing that I see on a daily basis. This is a fractured premolar number four on the maxilla on the top, top row. And this is the biggest tooth that the dog has. It's a three root tooth, and it's the tooth that sustains the most temp pressure when chewing. So a dog is chewing on a rock or a bone or a Barbie, <laughs> and, um, and that tooth will fracture. And so it doesn't look like that immediately unless there's already a lot of tartar on the tooth. But as soon as the smooth surface of the enamel is disrupted, tartar will adhere to it, and then it becomes, and then it looks like this. And so you'll get infection that gets up inside the gum line, and um, sometimes it just looks like this, and it's that flap that you see is actually movable. Sometimes it's not movable and we have to actually, you know, prove that it's fractured. And sometimes the infection is already there. And so it'll go up and underneath and you'll get a big swelling underneath the eye, which means you've got a tooth root abscess that has to be dealt with. 
other things that we'll find in the mouth, this is totally benign, is uh, just a little wart on a puppy, and that will honestly probably go away on its own without any inter intervention. But good to know, because it's viral and it's something we can prevent from spreading. And Other things that we see are ulcers on the tongue or ulcers on the gums. That's a dog. This is an ulcer. The ulcers can happen from underlying kidney disease. Kidney disease will cause uremic toxins to circulate and not be excreted by the kidneys. And then ulcers on soft tissue will occur in the mouth usually. Is it painful? Yeah, it's extremely painful. Yeah, it's, it's one of those super miserable experiences that really needs to be treated with some kind of topical anesthetic and then a systemic pain reliever. Um, and then treating whatever the underlying cause is. So, I mean, if it's just a local thing like a burn or a chemical burn, because they will lick things that they shouldn't, then it can be treated. But if it's secondary to something like renal failure, then um, not, not so well treated, not so easily treated, but good to know about because we can manage it. And then probably the next most common thing that we see is cancers in the mouth so common in cats and in dogs um, there is no cancer that occurs in the mouth that is a good prognosis uh, but often people will come in and think that they're dealing with dental disease or drooling or not being able to open their mouth or chew on their food or get their food when in fact we're dealing with a tumor as opposed to dental disease so that's also important to know for the owner so that they don't want to pursue dentistry and then super gross, yes, and the focus of our talk tonight is periodontal disease. And this mouth is more common than you might imagine. Um, this, is, this is a dog with um, what we like to call super yuck mouth. But this, um, these teeth are all severely decayed. And you can see the tartar. Of course, the tartar is very obvious, but what is more important is the infection and the bone decay and the gum recession that's evident at the, at the bottom of each tooth or at the gum line. She's asking, will you have to pull all the teeth? It's likely that in this situation that most of those teeth would go because they, can't, they just can't be saved. And so the dog will feel better, smell better, eat better. It's uncomfortable. I mean, there's probably some teeth in here that could remain. Um, I'm looking just at that, that canine tooth, the big kid tooth on the, on the corner, but the rest of those teeth, the insides are probably all gonna go. It's very common, it's preventable. We'll go through all the stages, but there's few things that you can really see unless you're looking under your dog or your cat's lip or lifting the lip and saying, Okay, there's, there's obvious dental disease here. You know, it's an undertreated, under-identified thing. And generally, it's something that we'll note at physical exam, mention it as an issue. And unless you really kind of push the issue and say, hey, this is really a problem, this, these teeth have to be addressed. Periodontal disease basically starts when bacteria contacts the space between the, the tooth and the gum line. The bacteria that are in the mouth lay down a film, and the film along with the salivary fluids and moisture, just create a film that gets hard and turns into a cement-like substance that we call plaque or tartar or calculus for those really super smart people. Um, okay, so this looks like a perfect mouth. When I looked at this picture, I thought, this is what we all want our dogs and cats' teeth to look like. But this is actually dental periodontal disease stage one, and you can see that there's some inflammation along the line between the, the tooth and the gum. And so that's actually, this is not something that we would ever tell you to come in and have treated, but it's something to look at and say, if you start home care now, you can probably prevent this from getting any worse and you can make it completely go away without any veterinary intervention. The gum line is where all that bacteria is, is staying. And so as it comes out from underneath the gum line, it starts to develop along the enamel of the tooth. You'll start to see the plaque. You'll start to see the cycle of damage that happens when that plaque gets hard and, and then creates inflammation around the gum line. And then those secrete more toxins. And then you have infection. And um, this, the immune system, of course, is stimulated by all of this inflammation and infection. So the immune system tries to send out normal white blood cells to fight infection. And so that immune response ends up creating a worse problem because those white blood cells create more inflammation and then with more inflammation becomes more open for bacteria to get in and so it overwhelms the immune system and then you get 
severe effects of dental disease. So essentially, it becomes almost like a not, not an autoimmune thing, but essentially a situation where the immune system isn't helping, it's making it worse. So again, this doesn't look that bad at all. Dental disease, periodontal disease, grade two. The teeth look fine, but the gums are starting to become more and more reddened, and you're getting more and more inflammation, which leads to infection, which leads to that whole cycle we just talked about. So this is a situation where this is a trick because this dog has already had his teeth cleaned. <laughs> so in this situation, the teeth look beautiful. The gums are still red from the scaling and from the subgingival probing that's been done. But with some antibiotics and with some home care, those gums will look normal within a, a few days, even to a week. So this is another example of grade two. The gums are much more inflamed than in the last picture. Again, this is post-dental, so you're just seeing the effects of some scaling and getting up in there to create the ability for those gums that are clean now to adhere back down to the enamel of the tooth. Uh, at this point, is that caused mostly by bacteria, by just um, bad food? Or... No, this is not from bad food. This is just genetics, time, and fortune. And it, it could happen if you were feeding the best food or the worst food. Um, it really has little to do with food, dry or canned. Yeah. She's asking, um, do you ever see the gums coming down over the teeth? And that is very common in cats. Are you referring to yeah, a cat? Yeah, I, I remember that. And I just noticed that one of your shots you had, it looked like the gum had been pushed back up. Yeah, and you'll see that in, in what I think you're describing is called a foral lesion, which is a feline odontoclastic resorptive lesion, which is where the, the um, root of the tooth be begins to be absorbed by the bone. The bone is starting to absorb the root of the tooth. It destroys the root. The gum attempts to fight back by covering uh, the exposed tissue, and um, that can't really be pushed back. Hello, colleagues. <laughs> uh, so we don't actually push that gum line back. When those teeth are affected by those foral lesions, we extract those teeth because they're incredibly painful. They will chatter under full anesthesia with those lesions. Yeah. These are, this is just an overview. We've talked about all these grades, but this is just a nice little chart to show you kind of what's happening underneath the gum line. Um, and really the, the level of tartar that you're seeing just corresponds to the amount of disease in the actual gum tissue as opposed to, we're not so much worried about the tooth because the whiteness of the tooth is essentially cosmetic. We're worried about the gum, the gum itself. We've talked about a lot of this. Um, gingivitis, which is essentially the inflammation of the gum line, of the gum tissue, um, results in loss of bone, loss of um, soft tissue around the bone, loss of gum tissue, and then the the tooth is no longer being held quite so well in the, in the socket, and so teeth become mobile and easily, um, easily removed. Fistulas are um, the, the effects of the root of the tooth, um, leaving a cavity in the bone where it once was seated, and often those fistulas, because the roots of the teeth communicate with the sinus cavities, uh, so often those, the removal or the falling out or the decay of those teeth will result in a, a giant defect that communicates between the mouth and the sinus cavity. So those have to be closed or at least managed. Um, okay, and then bacteria from the mouth, which we know is going right up into the bone, right up into the gum tissue, therefore into the bloodstream, can enter the bloodstream and cause effects on the liver and the kidney and the heart. Ananda's asking if, if it has nothing to do with food. Um, is this something that home care and prevention can, can deal with? Or, I guess what I'm asking is there isn't anything else you can do by giving bone to the dog or whatever. That's not there are thing. some bones that can be useful in preventing tartar buildup as long as they're using them regularly, like not just once every couple months, as long as they're chewing okay. and it's not damaging the teeth. There are some really good products out there that can help. Uh, but, but yes, if you can start early, just like with, with kids, if you can start early and get, you know, brushing teeth or at least disinfecting the gum lines, I, I'll talk about that a little bit, then all of this is truly preventable. Yeah, you can totally put me out of business. It's fine. Okay. Um, well, okay. So this is periodontal disease grade three, um, and it looks almost as gross as it could get, except you've seen grosser already. So um, again, we're looking at 
recession, you see how much that canine tooth, the gum line above it, has receded all the way up. It looks like a crescent has been cut out of that. Um, so severe gingival inflammation and bone or gum recession, uh, those teeth are most likely starting to become mobile. And so they will be needing to go. Grade four, um, the, it's a good wow factor picture, but this is a really good example because when you look, when you probably, when you flip the lip on a dog like this, it doesn't look that bad from the front. It really just, they look maybe a little bit dirty. Uh, but when you look in the back, you see that the gum is pronounced in its recession. Um, that what looks like pus, but really that's just um, calculus or tartar. That's some of it is still uh, moist and some of it is hardened. And so you've got severe disease throughout the mouth. But that canine, you see that there's an ulcer on the lip because that lip is sitting over that um, infected um, and tartar-filled tooth. And so it's that's a painful lesion. The whole mouth is probably painful, but treatment options. Um, so in a situation like a grade one, I would say, you know, home care and management at home, you really can get away with not having any dental um, investment or involvement. Grade two, probably the same way. You can do some home care, disinfection with chlorhexidine, um, and get away with you know, getting your dog or your cat back to good health without any dentistry. Um, grade three and grade four is going to require subgingival scaling and some, probably some extractions. Um, and and honestly, really, you have to do home care because if you're not going to do home care, then you have to do <coughs> frequent dentistries, which nobody really wants to do. Okay, so another example in a cat. Um, this is right before dental cleaning, this cat is under anesthesia. And that is uh, essentially a fistula right behind that canine tooth. Um, and that canine tooth, is, the root is exposed and that needs to all be cleaned out and extracted. So that tooth that's behind the canine tooth, that premolar, is, has what's called a foral lesion or a feline odontoclastic resorptive lesion. And so that tooth is, the root is absorbed and almost non-existent. And if you were to touch that, it would crack. And yeah, the, the tooth is extracted and then the root, we make sure that we've gotten the root because leaving a root inside is both painful and then also an avenue for more infection. There are um, sealants and some good products that have disinfectants in them that can be used to, you can, not you, but butter could chew on. I would like to see you chewing on a rope toy. That would actually be fun. Yeah, there are products that can be applied to something that they chew on that can help. But again, not at that stage. Once the teeth are clean and healthy and not painful anymore, um, then, then chewing can be really good. What do we do in a dentistry? Let's talk a little bit about that. Another, another wow picture to gross you guys completely out. Most of those teeth are honestly looking fairly good. Emily, Jessica, do you feel that those teeth can be saved? Some of them. Some of them. Sometimes it is really amazing that we can go in on a, on a mouth that looks like this and we can save many of, most of these teeth. Not all dogs have to have, or cats have to have multiple extractions. Sometimes getting that tartar off and getting a nice clean bleeding gum line and probing under there and cleaning it and polishing and disinfecting, we can get these teeth back and they can look good and smell good and actually be saved. Um, you're looking cynical. How long will they stay that way? With home care, they could stay that way forever. Without home care, they'll look like this again in eight to 10 months. Yeah. But if every six months they were cleaned, they could stay with mm -hmm. teeth Yeah, absolutely. Early intervention and good home care uh, can, can result in saving a lot of the teeth which is something I should probably mention because losing the teeth is not necessarily a bad thing. When there's no teeth, there's no dental requirements. And <laughs> um, sometimes that's, that's actually a good thing. Um, they do so well without their teeth. Um, they can eat, they can chew, they can do all the things that they did before and they don't have the pain and you don't have the annoyance of having to deal with their teeth. So if all the teeth are extracted or many of the teeth are extracted, well, sometimes they're very easy to extract. And when they're easy to extract, like many of these teeth look like they are, um, it's not, not as costly. Okay. Um, okay, so, and again, pain, infection, which results in behavior changes, 
withdrawn or just uncomfortable appetite changes, and then ultimately organ, organ system damage and a shorter lifespan can be expected. Okay, so when you guys go to the dentist, and I assume everybody goes to the dentist once in a while, um, we are very well behaved. I've only ever bitten my dentist once when I was having a crown put on and I didn't know he had his hand in my mouth. So um, <laughs> after that, I was a red dot muzzle type. <laughs> Um, but we are very well behaved and we don't bite and we don't scratch and we hold our mouths open and they say it's going to be okay and we believe them. Dogs and cats, not so much. So we have to have them under full general anesthesia, which is scary for people. And so that's the first question that people ask. I know this has to be done and I'm willing to do it, but I'm so scared because anesthesia is risky and someone I know lost their animal to another anesthesia or generally it is very, very safe in an animal that is otherwise healthy or that we're aware of other underlying diseases um, and we manage them appropriately. Um, and of course, the risk of chronic oral infection and pain is far more significant than the risk of anesthetic complications. So I went through a little what we do with anesthesia before, during, and after so that people understand that um, we take it seriously and it's, it's an involved process. We listen to their heart. We do that anytime they come in for a physical exam, whether they're getting an annual physical exam or they're there because they have a foxtail in their ear, they're gonna get their heart listened to. We take their temperature. If they have an elevated temperature, which suggests infection or inflammation somewhere, that's gonna be considered in the anesthetic plan. We generally perform pre-anesthetic blood tests. We're far more, we require those more stringently in older animals because there's more likelihood of underlying disease. If it's a two-year-old Maltese that has severe dental disease, we usually don't push that quite as hard. We sedate them so that their anxiety level is diminished and they're easier to handle. We give them antibiotics. Every single animal that has a dentistry or any dental procedure has antibiotics because we're mobilizing bacteria into the bloodstream. We don't want that to create problems. Um, we give them pain medication, and then they get an IV catheter, and they have fluids. Okay. The fluids, of course, support their organ system function, their temperature, and their blood pressure. During anesthesia, we are cognizant of their blood pressure, we keep them warm, and we monitor all their vital signs. Monitoring them is really nice, but if something changes, we actually make adjustments based on what we're finding when we monitor them. Okay, so during the dental itself, we look at each tooth and we look at the big picture and then we look at each tooth and we clean them first with an instrument that is designed to just chunk the tartar off. It's just a instrument that just breaks off the chunks of tartar and we rinse those out of the mouth. And then we have underlying tartar and gingivitis that we're dealing with. We wanna get the dirt out of the way. It's like sweeping before you vacuum. Then we scale with an ultrasonic scaler, which is essentially identical to what you would have done during a routine hygien hygienist cleaning. We then go do gin subgingival scaling, which goes under each and every tooth all the way around the circumference of the crown. And we then polish the teeth, not to make them look pretty, but because the ultrasonic scaler makes tiny little abrasions in the tooth, in the enamel. And by polishing those out, you smooth it out so that tartar can't build up. If you were to do a dental and clean them all up and not polish, you'd have tartar much more quickly than if you didn't. After we polish, we rinse, we apply a fluoride treatment. Fluoride is actually toxic if swallowed to all of us, including dogs and cats. So the fluoride is applied. It's allowed to foam and sit on the surface of the gum and the tooth, and then it's wiped away. And then a sealant is applied. And I'll talk about that sealant a little bit more here, but we apply the sealant so that when the dog or the cat goes out the door, they're good to go for home care for a good couple of weeks or even a month. And then by the time they've calmed down and you've calmed down, then you can start your own home care and it's as if there was no lapse. The patient is intubated during anesthesia. We maintain their airway for them. So when they are being recovered, we will remove that tube through which they received gas anesthetic and oxygen. We continue keeping them warm and we have our eyes on them or someone physically with them until they're awake. They can swallow, they're blinking, and they don't need to be under vigilant supervision. They get IV fluids for the rest of the day, pain is treated, and we send them home that afternoon. So anesthesia monitoring, this is just a picture of a 
animal getting a dental where they're surrounded by essentially uh, warm air being circulated and covered with plastic or paper so that temperature is controlled. Anesthesia is generally on the whole very, very safe and very routine unless there's some underlying condition that we hopefully know about prior to performing this procedure. Things that would increase the risk of anesthesia, of course, would be any kind of heart disease, any kind of other metabolic disease, kidney disease, thyroid disease, organ system function diseases. And again, most, most of our critters are up and standing and ready to go home 20 to 30 minutes later, but we keep them calm, quiet, and on fluids for the rest of the day. And so some of us, not me, but some of us have these, have a penchant for little smash-faced dogs, um, little brachycephalic breeds, basically any of these breeds that have a foreshortened head and have all of their their nasal passages and oral passages smashed up into a small small head are called brachycephalic breeds. Those include your pugs and your bulldogs and your King Charleses and your Bostons and Shih Tzus and Pekingeses. Those guys are actually more delicate anesthetic patients, much more risky. They also develop dental disease more readily because their teeth are much more compacted into a smaller space. They all have the same number of teeth as our 42 adult teeth that we talked about. Um, so these guys, we are much more vigilant about their airway. We extubate them after a much longer period of time, and we have to watch them more carefully because they like to stop breathing or become unable to breathe just based on their position. So happy Boston Terrier, much more careful with those Bostons. Common problems that we see during dentistry, this would be one that we might not see on physical exam, that we wouldn't see it because it's covered with tartar, and in fact, this tooth is fractured, and it's got an exposed root and pulp cavity. So this is a fractured tooth like we saw before, that one that was had a slab fracture. This one looks like the tooth just got cleaned, and that would be something we would discover and go, oh, we have to extract that tooth, and not, not expect, not have expected it. Right. Well, and sometimes the tartar covering that exposed root will lead you to think that there's nothing wrong with it. And then when you go clean the tooth and you discover it's fractured underneath, then you, it's, yes, it's more painful. This is another one of those big three root teeth, and this is fractured. This is, again, super, super common. We see this three times a week. This is, this is a very common thing. And this, uh, this tooth has to be extracted. Given that it's now compromised and, and in such a state, you'd think it would be really easy to extract. And of course, that wouldn't be the case. This is actually a surgical extraction where a flap would have to be created and this tooth would have to be sectioned with a high power drill and, and removed. Another example of that big three-rooted tooth, um, this is after cleaning, and you can see that there's a tract and an abscess that's come up underneath that gum line, and so this dog probably has a nice big swelling right under his eye that was the reason that the owner brought the dog in in the first place. There's something wrong here when really there's something wrong here. Three roots in that tooth. It's huge. Yeah, and so of course getting those roots out is is challenging. So this tooth is a this is the same tooth, and now we've used a high power drill to <laughs> section that into we're going to section it into thirds and pull out those roots individually. Pain management. So obviously these are painful things to have happen, and to have that dental disease, to have us probe underneath the gum line, to have us remove teeth. Local blocks can be used. Of course they're under general anesthesia when this occurs. So. They're not feeling this when it happens, but just like any extraction, of course, there's pain afterward. We, anytime there's uh, extractions or extensive dental work, we always send home pain medication with their antibiotics. That is a cat. Um, and again, we're using um, ultrasonic scaler here. The veterinarian is using magnifying lenses, and so we can see very clearly what's going on in those little tiny teeth. Okay, so home care. Um, the most important thing, as with anything, is commitment to a routine. Because um, if you're going to do it once or twice, it's not going to work. If you're going to do it, you know, regularly, I really, I don't, I don't brush my cat's teeth um, or my dog's teeth. But home care, I can do some sealants every couple weeks. What about the, the dental sticks that you can get? Are those really helpful? She's asking about dental sticks and can they be helpful if you're chewing on those? 
There are some products that are noted by the American College of Veterinary Dentistry that have been proven to be useful, and we can talk about some of those. A lot of products that are marketed for dental care and dental prophylaxis just are not useful, and they're fattening, and they're just not helpful. Chicken feet. <laughs> She's asking, can chicken feet be useful? Uh, not for the chicken, uh, but for the dog or the cat. Honestly, because we see so much um, gastritis, enteritis, um, foreign body obstruction, I would not recommend chicken feet, but I know there's a lot of clients, a lot of people that do it. Okay, and that's, you know, a small abrasive, you know. <laughs> Raw. I mean, we keep yeah. it frozen and then you give it to them, you know, right. if they're raw so the, so the bones weren't brittle. Right. And I'm not, brittle. I'm not a fan of that, but yeah. I can, I understand what you're saying. I, there are probably better ways to do it, but um, it, it is Willits. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not to minimize, because I know a lot of people that do that. And most of the time, probably 90% of the time, you're going to be fine. And then the, I see the 10% where, you know, there's a problem. And, right. So that's the problem with that. It's not that it's going to help the teeth, but it's... Yeah, I don't think that it's going to be harmful to the teeth. Um, I don't... And the benefit is going to be limited by the second, you know, the consequences of other, you know, other problems. The plaque that we've been talking about, this tartar that forms in the bacterial film, by disrupting that bacterial film from hardening into tartar, that's the goal of dental home care. It's not to keep the teeth white, although that will be a secondary benefit. It's not to keep the breath fresh, but that is also a secondary benefit. Of course, the Academy of Veterinary Dentists would love to tell you to brush your cats and dogs' teeth every day. I have five cats and two dogs and a job. And so I, <laughs> there's just no way. I mean, I'm lucky if I brush my own teeth twice a day. Um, so, you know, doing these things monthly, I mean, I try to do a basic wipe down and an oral sealant application just every time I do my heartworm prevention and flea control. Everything happens once a month and whatever happens in between. Okay, so, and gradually. Obviously, you can't take Leroy and say, Leroy, today is the start of a routine where I'm going to stick my finger in your mouth every couple of weeks. He's not going to go for that. Um, well, I, Inside filter. Okay. Oh, no, okay. They're, they're, they're free bristle toothbrush. All you have to do is just like this, and you cover all three things. And it was vanilla toothpaste, and it tasted like frosting. So I'm like, dang it, you know good. Right. So I did it, and he's like, wow, that looks kind of good. So <laughs> yeah, and getting them to just chew on a toothbrush yeah. is fine. I mean, there are dentifrices that are designed for dogs and cats. We like mint and spearmint, and all those things are, taste oh, good to us. Frosting. These guys like poultry and, uh, you know, beef and fish flavors. So just, you know, even just putting a little bit of that on a, on a doggy toothbrush and getting them just to chew on it. You don't have to brush at first. You don't have to really do anything other than get them, get them to accept that there's an object. It's not threatening. It could go near my mouth. I don't have to bite it. I'm okay. Yeah. So patience. So there are tons of products out there. Human toothpaste are not okay for the same reason you don't let your little kids and grandkids ingest toothpaste because it contains fluoride. We don't want fluoride anywhere except on our teeth and gums. We want it not in our, in our bodies. We have finger brushes that just slip on over your finger. They're soft. They have a little brush on the, on the tip and you can apply something or you can just get them used to having it near them or in their mouth. There's wipes, there's pads, there's toothbrushes. There's tons of products out there you could spend years talking about all of them. Any of them are good as long as you're touching the gum line and touching the tooth. So <laughs> this is a, a toothbrush. And some dogs really don't mind this and they're fine with it. And some dogs don't want that long plastic thing near their mouth. So you just have to figure out what's going to work for you. And usually I start out with just a soft little finger brush because it's easy as long as your dog's not likely to bite you. Here's a finger brush. And again, the quadrants that you're going to be focusing on with home care, never inside the, the surface that the tongue touches, you don't have to worry about because the tongue will take care of all that tartar ever from building up. So it's only the outsides. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And those are, that's it. 
um, and really you don't even have to focus anywhere else except the interface between the gum line and the tooth. The rest of the tooth you can ignore and just, just that little line. Chlorhexidine is a disinfectant that is sold over the counter by your veterinarian or basically at any pharmacy. Um, a 2% solution is disinfecting and safe to, for ingestion, safe to put in the mouth. There are rinses that you can get that you can squirt in the mouth. There's gels that you can get to just kind of smear on the gums and the gum line. And then there's all kinds of fancy products that you can buy with lots of brand names. But basically, as long as it's a good disinfecting chlorhexidine gel or liquid, it's safe and good to use as a denifrous. There are diets, rawhide products, chews. We'll talk about some of those. But really, consistency and as long as they're really getting contact between the chew and the gum surface, that is the object here. Or a vet, there are a number of sealants out on the market. There's probably three or four sealants out on the market. This is the oldest one that's been available for the longest time. I like it probably just because I've used it the most. Um, this is a um, gel-like product that um, is kind of a, like a little gel-like paste. And we apply it after we've cleaned and polished and fluoride treated the teeth and we also sell it and you can go you can take it home and basically just take a little bit of it and smear it along those quadrants like we talked about just on the gum line where it meets the tooth um, and if you do that twice a month or even once a month you're in way better shape than if you don't it's a sealant that essentially barricades the spot where that plaque likes to form so it's just essentially keeps that tartar from forming in that spot. Cats, holly, cats. It's important not to get killed while you're doing this. It's important to read your cat. If they're, if they're going to, you know, if they're going to be into this, then that's one thing. But if they're just absolutely going to be aggressive to you or withdraw or it's going to change your relationship, leave it to your veterinarian. Don't try to do it at home. But if you can do it, the best time to do it is when they're kittens and when they've just had a dental. Um, because then their teeth are clean and perfect, and if you can do some home care, then you can prevent them from ever needing to have any dentistry, or for the most part. Again, this is another one. If you if you allow your cat to lick the toothpaste, the veterinary toothpaste, off a brush or off your finger, if they can get it in their mouth and they like the flavor of it and it becomes a positive thing for them, then it's something they look forward to and enjoy. It should never be a punishment or a forced thing because you can't really force a cat to do much unless they're <laughs> under general anesthesia. Um, so with cats, even so with dogs, but much slower, you have patience and give up early if you're going to get hurt. Um, so see how nice this kitty is? <laughs> that kitty may be sedated. You don't know. <laughs> Yeah, if they're sleepy, yeah, yeah, and that's a good time to say, oh, hey, look, I have this little bit of toothpaste on my finger, and they lick it off, and they say, oh, that's fabulous, I want more of that, and it's crunchy, like sort of similar to toothpaste, it's, it's got a, a, like a, um, a little abrasive in there, so if they lick it, and they chew on it, they find that attractive, they might be interested in chewing on a toothbrush or a finger brush that has some of that on there. Um, and that's a really good way to get them interested in doing it. I know my cats really like to chew on toothbrushes that they're not being offered. So, so see, I share toothbrushes yeah. too. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anesthesia-free dentistry. The bane of the veterinary existence and <laughs> very, very bad. So as you guys have seen with all these pictures, the problem is not on the surface of the tooth. The problem is in the gum, and the, and the disease that happens affects more than the tooth. It's the gum, the bone, and systemic health. So anesthesia-free dental offerings have cropped up all over the United States, and people think that they can bypass good home care and good veterinary care by just simply taking their puppy into the equivalent of a groomer's, and they knock off some tartar and then everything's okay. And it looks better. Usually it looks better for about two weeks until the tartar just comes right back because the problem isn't solved. Um, but also when there's severe dental disease, they're opening up a route of infection. Teeth can be lost, gums, jaws can be broken. We have seen, fortunately around here, we don't have a lot of anesthesia-free anesthesia dentistry offered. 
But in the Bay Area and the bigger cities, there's a tremendous amount of trouble with this with this practice. Um, there's a lot of broken jaws and broken teeth and unfortunate outcomes. So don't go down that path. Um, it's definitely not recommended, and it's it's often worse than no care. Starting early, starting right after dentistry's sprays and additives to water, worthless. Unless it's chlorhexidine based, unless you're actually putting something in the mouth. But if you're you know being sold something at a pet store that is supposed to miraculously cure tartar to the extent that you saw in these photographs, it's not going to happen. TD treats. This is Hill's prescription diet's answer to a dental treat. They're made for cats, dogs, and then small breed dogs. And the goal here is that the kibble is designed such that it's bigger than your traditional kibble so that the dog doesn't just inhale it. We've all seen dog and cat vomit. It comes up whole. They don't chew. They really don't chew. So this, this treat has to be chewed. And the, the goal of it's being chewed is that it breaks in such a way that it squeegees the tooth and the gum line. And it can be helpful. Again, it's not going to solve already existing grade three or four dental disease, but it can help prevent it. It's a, just sort of an adjunct. We know that dogs and cats with healthy teeth are happier and healthier. Um, emphasize home care and brushing. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. Would those work? To chew on or to put in the food? They chew on. They chew on them. Anything that is going to be an abrasive against the tooth and touch the gum line can be helpful. And if a bruises capsule or tablet is going to break apart in such a way that it acts as a squeegee along the gum line, it can be helpful. It doesn't matter what kind of food. I just want, and I looked online about dry food, and they said no because they do swallow it. And right. The wet food's almost better. And I just wondered if, um, yeah, if, I mean, I'm sure it's not, like you said, there's nothing you can do, it's not the food, but I think that there <laughs> And getting food in there. Right, right. And just, you know, if you just do some basic brushing or just, you know, get some of that tartar, just, yeah. it's cat, okay, well. And it's getting that. Uh, and cats a, won't shoot up food. Their cats are so notorious for essentially tearing it apart and eating it whole. So yeah. with kibble, unless you're, um, unless you're thinking more like um, uh, meat in in gravy. So it yeah. you kind of chew that, or you think it's just they still just swallow it whole. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, cats are hard. You know, unless you eat the TV treats, can be helpful. But again, only if they've already started off with the mouth. So dry food is not good for them. No, dry food is fine for them. There's, there's <laughs> but they're swallowing yeah. it. They're just swallowing it. Yeah, they're not. They're not chewing it. So. Well, because my cat didn't have any sign of needing dental work, and he's um, until he was nine, and then he had to have a equal mm -hmm. and the next year too. And I said, well, isn't there something I can do? Maybe bring him like half a year, uh -huh. or, uh, which would be less expensive than the extractions. Right. And then less <laughs> And it's right. possible that just, uh, uh, you think what, just six months or you think four? It just, it depends on the cat, honestly, or the dog. And, and it may be that just those disease teeth that he had are now gone and you may not have, to have any further extractions on him. It was the resort thing. Yeah. And they, usually those can be identified at one point, as yeah. opposed to they don't really develop them like consistently over time. They usually have them to begin with, and so we see them and uh, we try to get them all out so that you don't continually have to return for, for yeah. future And then the second set, so I started using the, um, I was given um, the glucosamine, mm -hmm. and that was for um, to help with hearing um, condition. And then, after, so I wondered if that in that year that made the teeth work, the teeth worse because the um, they were we had grown into the bone, the, the jawline or something. So I wondered could that glucosamine 
I would have been like that because that was the only thing that was different. I wouldn't think that the glucosamine could cause a problem like that. That would be really um, So there's nothing, no, nothing that's particularly. Um, and then I was thinking of the prescription diet for urinary. Uh -huh. it, that, because it's always been on that. Right. But and if there's nothing like, really. Like vitamin D supplements in the foods or. No, those urinary diets are designed to acidify the urine so that they don't obstruct with crystals. But there's really nothing that should Not cause more sitting on the tartar. You know, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. Did you have a question? I had a question. What gives someone a range that they could expect to pay if they bring their dog in for a day? So for a routine dental, um, say a dog with a grade three, say, Say, say your dog doesn't have such horrible dental diseases to be represented in one of those wild pictures. Um, if it's a young, healthy dog and we don't do any blood work and we're just trying to get the teeth under control, probably around $550. Mm -hmm. And then if we're doing blood work, and um, it's probably going to be around $750. Mm -hmm. And that's without you know, extractions. Okay. So once we get into the extractions, it depends on how many roots the tooth, how long it takes, how much extra anesthesia sure. time. So it's just completely dependent on how long and how difficult. Yeah. Do you support national dental month? I support it. I, I we don't have a dental special during the dental month, although we could. I mean, typically those are really. Um, I mean, they're sort of from LA. And that's yeah. From the big clinics. Yeah, so the big clinics do it because February is their slowest time of year. Yeah. We haven't seen a slow time of year yet, <laughs> okay. and so typically we don't. But you know, we're open to that. We can yeah. talk about that. I mean, I know a lot of the reps have come in and asked us if we'll do something yeah, with them as a partner. Up. You know, it was nice to just that. The, 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 I, I used to say this because I used to work for the vet clinic down there. Yeah. Like, you know, we would give them the Burbeck C T shoes and the finger brushes. Yeah. And just a little bag. There you go. And, yeah. And some dental shoes. And some treats. You know, take some. Tea 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 Toothpaste and stuff mm -hmm. like that to try. Yeah, we can we can do that. We haven't done that yeah. yet, but we can certainly do that. I think it's a good idea because we probably don't educate folks about home care as much as we should. And that so. leads me to another question. Um, greenies. Uh -huh. Oh, greenies. I know. He he loves loves you to, to Dr. Emily to address <laughs> greenies. He's trying to hide in the back. Yeah. <laughs> What's your about greenies? Yes. I don't know. Are those the ones that you were saying? Maybe add weight and. Well, yeah. My opinion is that, I mean, and I'll let Dr. Emily speak to it. My opinion about greenies, and not the pill pockets, but the no, greenies, greenies, like the little things that are shaped like toothbrushes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're a little bit gimmicky. They are fattening, and they don't chew them. They just swallow them, and then we get to take them out of their intestines, oh, which is really? a great practice builder. Um, but that's not the kind of practice building we like to yeah, promote. Because he uh, chews them. Yeah, if he chews them and yeah. it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, like squeegeeing and contacting that gum line, then don't mind, but... fine. As long as they're breaking them apart and getting them, pardon me, but gooey and they're actually doing something, fine. But if they're ingesting them whole, because most people want to give them a little one, and oh, no, if I you're giving them an appropriate size one, they can be useful, but they can also obstruct on that. And so I can't recommend them. I mean, I, we had a chewing problem, obviously, and the constructive versus destructive chewing. Um, his favorite is hard plastic bones. Uh -huh. Which again, I mean, the, the American College of Veterinary Dentists does not recommend chewing on hard plastic. Um, the hard plastic chews were developed because they're nice because they don't splinter like bone. Yeah. Um, but they're harder than bone. Yeah, and mm -hmm. they don't give. And so dogs break their teeth on them, mm -hmm. they swallow yeah. them, they abstract on them. So again, I'm not a fan, but you know, those little bumpy like nylon bone things, if you can actually get your dog to chew on those, if you can put a little peanut butter or a little cat food on them, that's a then that can be useful. <laughs> as long as they don't destroy them and swallow them, no. it can be useful. Okay. Yeah. As long as when he starts vomiting, you're in Newport and not your notes. <laughs> 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 so 